people who had come back to see the first voyage into time. This is presuming a universe where you can travel back into time, but only as far as the invention of the first time machine. Well, I, this is the kind of universe I think we're living in for no good reason other than this is what the mushroom told me. I said, you know, is time travel possible? And it said, yes. And I said, into the future? And it said, yes. And I said, into the past? And it said, only as far into the past as the moment of the invention of the first time machine. I said, why? And it said, because before that there were no time machines. Duh. <laughs> so, uh, so in that kind of a universe, when you sail back in time, and get to the, the, to keep the grandfather paradox from happening, I think all the rest of time happens instantly. So it becomes more like a god whistle, more like some kind of evolutionary fast forward button, where you're somewhere in the historical continuum messing around with technology and society and this and that. Then you invent a time machine and zip! The rest of history happens uh, in the next few milliseconds as the whole thing goes nova. Yeah, machine is a very general term. I mean, the machine might be a mantra, a drug, uh, a, 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 a physical position. This is the kind of stuff we were playing with at La Chirera. But I don't, I'm, I'm now afraid of it because I know that it's real. You, ha you have to believe you're going to fail to attempt to build a time machine because no one in their right mind, if they thought it was going to work, would in fact climb into the gleaming saddle and slam the lever forward. You have to believe that you're going to fail or you wouldn't do that. The name of the game is to bring back real information. I mean, that's how you will convince the rest of us to do it and to believe you. And I think it can be done. I think probably shamanism is about this. <coughs> but, you know, I really, like one of the things we talked about a little bit here, but maybe not enough, is this bell, non-local information space that seems to lurk beneath the surface of ordinary reality. For 50 years in quantum physics, this was denied as so counterintuitive and leading to such bizarre conclusions and possibilities that it must be impossible. And now they've done experiments that pretty much show this is real. This is real. And what it means is all the mystics of history were right. You can journey from any place in the universe to any other place instantly. You can extract information that lies on the other side of the cosmos instantly. It's all done in the imagination. The imagination is this sense which you have that is your non-local perceptor. Your local perceptors are your eyes, your ears, the surface of your body, so forth. The non-local perceptor is the imagination. And it's giving you a continuous holographic readout of the bell non-local dimension. And then, and it's like a, it's like a cheat on your being trapped in, in the evolutionary cul-de-sac of Newtonian space and time. You are trapped in the evolutionary cul-de-sac of Newtonian space and time, but you have this little tiny peephole, this doorway, into the entire cosmos, all the races that ever were there, all the catastrophes and civilizations and philosophies and messiahs and so forth and so on. And, but you have to like tune it. 99.99999% of this bell information is utterly incomprehensible to the human mind because it's on a scale too large or too small or it involves premises or environments or presuppositions so bizarre that we can't grok them. But the remaining 0.000001% of this data is absolutely fascinating. Beings, philosophies, works of art, ruins, planets, 
herophonies, strange music, strange art, strange ideas, endlessly to be explored and then to be brought back as much as can be to the human camp and examine. I mean, we are hunters and gatherers in hyperspace as much as we are in in 3D. And what we're roving and scanning for in those informational spaces is things which delight us or make life more comfortable or inform our relationship to each other or our uh, environment. The future lies in the imagination. You know, the imagination is going to get louder and louder and louder. William Blake saw this. We talk about virtual realities, designer drugs, downloading ourselves into circuitry, travel through time, disincarnate bodies, cloned identities, gender shifting, point of view shifting, uh, all of these things. This is all about the rules of mind overwhelming the rules of physics. The rules of physics say, you know, you are a body, you are on a planet, you have weight, you have momentum, you have specific gravity, you must behave like this and like this and like this. And mind says, no, I want to be pure, unleashed conceptuality. I want to be a thought blown in a hyperdimensional wind. I want to move from planet to planet with the twink of an eye. I want to know everything, see everything, be everything, feel everything. And then by that means, somehow, I will make my way back to my higher and hidden source. And who knows, you know, maybe this always awaited us beyond the grave, and what we're doing in some sense is drawing death into the world and erasing that most profound of all boundaries distinctions. The distinction between life and death itself becomes thin, becomes transparent uh, in these contexts. I mean, I, it's very easy to imagine technologies such that human identity will be scrambled beyond imagining. You know, if you can download yourself into circuitry, you can uh, make copies of yourself. If you can make copies of yourself, you can collage these copies and make selves that never were or might have been. You can have multiple identities. Uh, In one of Greg Egan's stories, people have this thing inside them that is implanted when you're two years old that's called, it it starts out being called the dual and it ends up being called the jewel. And what it is, is it's a thing which simply maps and studies your nervous system and creates a perfect copy in silicone of, of your being for the first 23 years of your life. Well, then when you're 23, you go through this ceremony where the body is vaporized and the dual, this eternal copy of your youthful self, lives on. Uh, this is, you know, within reach. Uh, Hans Moravik had the idea that you could take, uh, you could nano-engineer bacteria such that they, uh, you could nanotechnologically engineer a leprosy bacteria because leprosy moves along the nerves from the point of infection. Uh, A bacteria that would lay down uh, a thin wire of molecular gold along every nerve And so you would undergo these operations where you would slowly be changed into a thing of gold and silicon, glass and arsenic. But there would be no moment of transition, no loss of consciousness, no speed bump, no transition of identity. It's just over time you would become something completely eternal and machine-like. You know that poem by William Butler Yeats, Sailing to Byzantium? where he says, once out of nature I would be a thing of gold and gold enameling set before the lords and ladies of Byzantium to sing of what was and what will be. Once out of nature, what he means is when I am dead, 
I will be a thing of gold and gold enameling. There's the image of the flying saucer coming out of the collective unconscious. We want to become the stone 